So, hello everyone. Nice to see you. So, this week's topic, as some of you already know, is visualization. And specifically, today is um, visualization and beyond visualization. Okay, so today we're covering a little bit more the limits of visualization, actually exploring a little bit the nature of visualization as a tool that can be used in certain circumstances, it can be used to achieve things, but it also has its limits. So like a tool, like I said last week, or the last, sorry, last Tuesday, um, like when you use a certain tool to build, I don't know, build a fence or pull up a wall in your house or something like this, then you're actually using that tool for precisely that task. And when the task is done, you drop the tool. You don't need to carry the tool into the shower, sleep with the tool in your bed, or, you know, have it on your breakfast table. Instead, it's okay, you, the task is done, you put the tool down. The same is true for visualization and the exercise of imagination, using crea creativity of the mind, using the ability to imagine things and to feel things even before they have happened is actually a very helpful thing. So here, the power of visualization is that you can access states regardless of whether circumstances are already established or not. So for example, you can feel healthy, even though you may not physically be healthy. You can access the feeling of healing or being healthy, which is supporting exactly these physical functions. As you feel that you're healing or you feel that you're getting better, the body responds to the way you feel because your brain doesn't actually know the difference between what you imagine and what is a fact. That's why a placebo actually works. With a placebo, it's well known that even though there's no active ingredients, it still works. So how is that possible? How is it possible that you take a pill and it heals you? They've done this uh, famous experiment of having that one group where they gave people the pill that is supposed to wake you up. It, gives, it energizes you. And the other group, they gave sleeping pills. And they told the group that they gave sleeping pills that these were energizers. And the other group, that they were sleeping pills. And exactly, that, even though the people were taking ener active ingredients that make you energetic, they were getting sleepy. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and the other group, they were starting to feel really awake, even though they were taking sleeping pills. Yeah? So there's, there's many such uh, scientific studies that have been done concerning placebo effect. It was pretty interesting to actually have a look at this and explore a little bit because it actually shows the power of our own expectations and the subconscious power of expectations that we also have. It's not just consciously expecting, I take that pill so I'm supposed to feel like this. It's a very subconscious process. <coughs> Expectation. Yeah. So you can use that to your advantage. You can use the ability to access states and experiences even though the external circumstances that would support the experience are not given. They're not there. Right? So like you can feel that you're, um, for example, protected and guided. Let's say a Christian who believes in God and believes that God is guiding their way and carrying them through life and providing and so forth they lead a happier life and they would have many experiences in their life that would confirm their belief. Because once you do have a belief, a belief set, you seek for things outside that confirm that belief set, that confirm your inner experience. So a Christian seeks to find confirmation that God is everywhere. Okay, and for them, it's a very real, serious experience. Like for an atheist, it's a different kind of experience. You say, no, there is, there is no God, or uh, traditionally atheism doesn't say that there is no God, they simply say that we don't know whether there is a God or not. So the experience that an atheist has would confirm this belief, 
would confirm that mindset. So our mindset continuously seeks to find a confirmation through the external world and the experience that we make with other people. We find a confirmation of who we are again and again. So that's why visualization can be used as a helpful tool to change that a little bit. So you can design your inner experience so that the outer experience starts to match with that and starts to confirm the inner experience that you're having. So you're basically changing your life from the inside out. Does that work like magic? So if you sit here and you imagine that delicious food comes up to you, will the food come? Yeah, probably not. <laughs> yes. Regardless of what some people say, maybe if you're a very powerful visualizer, the food might just manifest in front of you. I don't know about that. Yeah. But um, just practically speaking, somebody that has an optimistic mindset and that can get into the feeling state of a desired result, they achieve these results easier. That's why athletes, top athletes, they use visualization. That's why they use it in the military, in the NASA and so forth. They use it in their programs for various tasks because it's a useful tool. It's been successfully proven many times that it helps. Okay. So why not use it? But then after all, it's just a tool. Okay. And it has its limits. What are the limits of visualization? Now, visualization is limited by being conditioned, first of all, being a condition in itself. So it is subject to cause and result. That's one limitation. So it is subject to change. Therefore, it cannot be satisfying. That's what that really means. Yeah? So if you, let's say you could even have the power to visualize anything you wanted and it would all materialize. There's actually this little story. You have these five little boys sitting in the park and suddenly they find an empty beer bottle and they rub it and poof, a genie comes out of it. A beer genie <laughs> and he says okay each one of you has one wish and so the first boy says I'm really hungry I want to have a hamburger and the best hamburger in the world and so BAM there's this best hamburger in the world appearing right in front of him and the second little boy thinks well hmm why don't I wish for something a bit better because he will eat his hamburger and then that's it he kind of wasted his wish, right? So why not go a bit deeper? And so he asks, I want to have a hamburger chain worldwide. And poof, he has this hamburger chain worldwide. He can eat hamburgers whenever he wants to because it's his restaurant. And the third boy thinks a bit further. He thinks, well, why just hamburgers? I could actually wish for a little bit more, right? So he wishes for an infinite amount of money. I always have money whenever I need it. Poof. He has this never-ending bank account. It's always full. And the fourth boy thinks, well, how could I top that? And he's very clever and he wishes for infinite wishes. So I wish that I had infinite wishes and poof, he has infinite wishes. <laughs> right. Now the fifth boy thinks, how can I top that? And he looks at all these other four little boys and he understands something. And so he voices his wish and he says, I wish I had no wishes. So amongst those five, who is probably the happiest boy? Who is likely to be most satisfied? Who is likely to be at ease? And who is likely to be constantly agitated? In fact, the more wishes you have, the more agitated you are. The more you experience actually a wish always points to its opposite, which is lack, doesn't it? Like hunger, or like wanting to eat, points to hunger, doesn't it? It's pure logic. I can't argue with that. 
wanting to eat points to some sort of hunger. It doesn't have to be physical hunger, it can be emotional hunger, right? We all know that. But the wishing itself, it points to restlessness. It points to someone that lacks. I don't have enough. I need more. And as long as that feeling of I need more is there, I can't rest. And the funny thing is, once your wish is fulfilled, since you have infinite wishes, it's not that clever really, you immediately have the next wish. So in fact, you're in a perpetual state of restlessness, never really arriving, at least never really arriving for long. You arrive shortly before the next wish kicks in and doesn't let you rest again. And so that's actually us, isn't it? That fourth boy. We have infinite wishes. Wishing never ends. Wanting never ends. And so here is the limit of visualization. Because visualization, when it turns into a tool of wanting, it'll be just that. It will lead to never-ending wanting. And every want that we have is like an itch. It must be scratched. And so are you going to spend your entire life itching and scratching? Or is there more to life than itching and scratching? Is there more to life than just running around for the next kick, the next thing to get, the next thing to be? Even in spiritual circles it's very popular to sit down because we want to try to become someone enlightened maybe. Even though nobody really knows what that means, we still try. <laughs> or we try to be very peaceful. What does that point to? I'm not peaceful. I try to get rid of my thoughts. What does that point to? I'm full of thoughts. And it also points to me not liking my thoughts very much. Me being attacked by thoughts. So I have to get rid of them. Thoughts are my enemies. So I use visualization to pop, to pop them like balloons. Let's get rid of them. Let's fight them all. And of course that is an endless fight again because you, you defeat one thought, the next the thought comes right up. Yes, I have defeated one thought. Then you defeat that thought, the next thought comes right up. It's endless. If you're fighting against your restless mind, you are deeply entrenched in restlessness. It's like that person that jumps into the current to fight the water. It's totally pointless. The only thing that this leads to is stress. There's another story that points to this limit of endless trying and having and wanting and getting. There's this, maybe you know that story already. There's this uh, very wealthy businessman. He, he's on a holiday and he comes to this beautiful beach in a sleepy fishing village and he finds that old fisherman, he just sleeps in a hammock. And so he sits down there next to the fisherman and when the fisherman wakes up, the wealthy businessman asks him a question. He says, hey, what are you doing here? And the fisherman says, oh, I'm just resting, waiting for the night to go out fishing. And so the wealthy businessman, let's call him Pete, Pete asks him, now, why don't you fish during the day too? You could make more money with that, right? If you would spend a few more hours during the day at least, you would make more money than all the other fishermen who sleep through the entire day. And so the fisherman says, Ah, okay, interesting. And then? And then the businessman says, Okay, now if you could spend more hours during the day getting more fish, you could eventually afford a second boat and maybe staff who could work for you so you could catch even more fish. You can't catch double the amount. You could in fact have your staff work for you during the daytime and you work during the nighttime. And the fisherman goes, interesting. And then? And then the PT goes, he's in his element now, right? He's like giving advice, right? So he says, okay, well, let me calculate. So when you have these two bowls and you make an enormous amount of income, double your income, you could eventually buy a big fishing trailer. 
and you could maybe employ a whole crew. You could catch maybe five times the amount that you're catching right now. You could have the biggest fishing company in this town. The fisherman goes, okay, and, and then? Then the fisherman says, well, you make a whole bunch of money with that, so eventually you could expand and you could buy a whole fleet of fishing trailers. You could fish like crazy. Imagine the possibilities, he said. And the fisherman says, well, that sounds interesting. And, and then? Well, with all the money, you could buy yourself a house right here at the beach and you could just relax. And the fisherman says, well, that's exactly what I'm already doing. <laughs> and how many of us spend life exactly that way? We stress out so that we can relax. We work ourselves to death so that we can enjoy retirement. And then when retirement comes, we spend all that hard-earned money for the doctor. If we get there. Or we spend it perpetually still wired from life. Now what to do? Life has no purpose anymore. I have nothing to do. Who am I now? And we have to redefine ourselves again. Stress. We're not at ease. Because we have never trained to be at ease during our lifetime. We've never trained to relax. We're constantly wanting the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Now visualization very often becomes a tool for exactly that pattern. Wow, now you can visualize. You can have it all. And then, when I have it all, then I can relax, says the mind. Are you going to believe this? Like once you get it all sorted, it's a very popular belief, once you get it all sorted, then you can be happy and relaxed. Does that work? I'm, you know, I'm trying actually, I'm trying this one, I'm trying as I speak, I'm trying to organize my life in a way that I don't have to work that much anymore. And you know, all I'm doing is, I I'm working every day so that I don't have to work any more later, which is ridiculous. And it's, it's not abating. It's getting more and more work. Because every single time I, am, I actually finish a work, I'm uncomfortable. I'm like, uh, now I actually have time. How weird. What could I do? And then I find myself another task. I say, like, wow, now I have extra time I could do another video series, or I could do another this or that. You name it. And boop, I'm up to my neck again in another project, totally busy. Because really what's at the base of this is we are uncomfortable with ourselves. As soon as you have time, what will be revealed? Discomfort. The, the itch. And then what's the instinct? To scratch. And that takes various shapes. Well, you want to distract yourself with your phone, or you want to read a magazine or another book, or get lost in a conversation, or get a, start a new relationship. But something, anything but me, anything but looking at myself, because it's really itchy. And why is it so itchy? Because that's all we practice all the time. We practice itching and scratching. Life is, for most people, only these two aspects, itching and scratching. Oh, my knee hurts, I change. Oh, my back hurts, I change. I'm hungry, I eat. I'm tense, I get a massage. I'm cold, turn, uh, I'm hot, I'm turning on the aircon. I'm stiff, need some exercise. I'm sore, need another massage. I'm hungry again, I need to eat. And so this is never ending, do you see? Life's demands don't end, ever. 
But what could end is being consumed by life's demands continuously. That could end. And that gives rise to happiness, to natural well-being, restfulness, easefulness, peace, inner peace. Inner peace simply means you're not pulled around by stuff anymore. And visualization, and that's why I say all these things, because visualization very often, as I said just before, is a tool of that. Wanting, trying, getting, consuming, producing. What could I reach out for next? Where could I... At the bottom of all that is this question, where can I find myself? And we look in shopping malls, and we look in restaurants, and we look in relationships, and we look in the future, and we look in the past, and we don't find ourselves. Why not? Because we look everywhere but in ourselves. To be more precise, we look everywhere but in the looking. That's where you can find yourself. It's not what you're looking at. It's where you're looking from. That's who you are. And as long as we're looking for stuff to look for and look at and play with, we don't see ourselves. We're lost in endless movies, endless dramas and plots that need to be solved. There's this unhappy me that tries to become happy and now I try meditation. Oh, it doesn't work. I'm so distracted. Let's try another technique, another retreat. And then many people hop from retreat to retreat, retreat hopping. They change their teachers like their underwear, you know, just jumping around trying, ah, oh, it doesn't work, ne next thing, you know. Well, I found this very profound technique. It's amazing, it's so profound, it's so much more profound than the other technique that I've used. This is nothing but consumerism, coloring, spiritual practice. Like we go shop for spiritual stuff. Still, it's all about stuff. I want the experience. I want to feel so blissful. I want to feel so kind and loving. I want to feel so fulfilled and happy. I want, aka, I'm lacking. I'm so badly lacking. That's all that it says. I want to be happy. I lack. That's what I hear. So if you really want to be happy though, I think that's a very good wish to have. If you want to be fulfilled and at ease, experiencing inner peace and balance. Where can you find that? Where, where would it be? Where can you find peace? And well, it's obvious for all of us that you cannot find it in stuff. And in other people, you cannot find it in other people too. You cannot find yourself in other people. Even though it's very tempting because the, there's this dynamic between, the dual dynamic between two people, right? There's an attraction going on. And if this attraction is going on, that we find, we think that this other person is somehow completing us. Are you incomplete? Doesn't that point to this? If I say to my wife, honey, you complete me. Am I not at the same time saying, I am incomplete? Are you a half? Are you a 50% thing? It's up for reflection. Are you a 50%? Were you born and the doctor was like, <gasps> another 50%? Now let's find the other 50% so we can make them complete. A baby doesn't have no sense of that. It doesn't feel I'm incomplete because it, doesn't, it hasn't learned that yet to feel incomplete. But if you grow up in a consumer society, you quickly learn that you're incomplete. You learn it in school. Your grades are not good enough. You could be number one in class. Once you're number one in class, you have to maintain that. You have competition, constantly pushing, pushing. And your parents, they don't love you if you don't perform. You better perform, otherwise you're grounded. It's so many little things that teach us that we desperately have to try to be complete, to be appreciated, be loved. Is visualization just another tool in the hands of someone looking for love? Then 
there is its limitation. Because everybody looking for love hasn't found it, is lacking love. And where can you find it again? Do you have to bother other people and make them love you? By being all nice to them and becoming a people pleaser? Always saying yes, even though you mean no, in the hope that the other person then sees what a nice and pleasant person you are and you get that liking from the other person, that appreciation and loving is visualization in the hands of that person. Then what will it turn that person into? It will ingrain this habit of people pleasing more deeply. Now it's a people pleaser with a powerful tool of visualization. Now I can make everyone like me. And maybe I have learned that I can make people like and appreciate me if I have fancy cars or material goods that show that I'm wealthy. So I will go hardcore for that. I will visualize wealth in the morning, look at myself in the mirror. I feel wealthy and powerful. I jump into my Honda Jazz and I think it's a Ferrari. and so forth. I've visualized. I want to be more wealthy, but that's not the point. Wealth is not the point. It's just that we have learned to connect wealth with appreciation and love in some time in our life. At some point you have learned, ah, I can only be appreciated if I have a lot of stuff. In Germany, for example, where I'm from, we call it a, a Leistungsgesellschaft, which means it's a society that is all about performance, a performance society, if you translate it directly. So everyone performs. Everyone tries to perform the best. Performing really well. How are you performing today? Performing great. Well, I can see you have a beautiful family, you have a nice house, and Based on all the stuff that surrounds you, I can see that you must be a someone that performed well. And I can be seen as someone that has been performing well. I feel, ah, I feel settled. So it gives me somewhat feeling of ease. But it's very shaky. Very shaky. But as soon as I stop performing well, the feeling of ease goes down the drain. So it's not an authentic feeling of ease. It's not the real deal. Because it's based on stuff. Now you turn visualization towards yourself, maybe, and you say, I want to be more kind. Now you take it to the next level. It's a bit better. It's not anymore about trying to get stuff. It's about really enjoying pleasant and wholesome states of mind, kindness, compassion, generosity, luminosity, whatever. Love. And you visualize yourself being a very kind, very loving person. Nice, you're closer to the source already. But we're still somehow within circumstances. Kindness is a circumstance. Emotions are circumstances. Thoughts are circumstances. So there's still this limitation. We're still looking within conditions for some sort of rest. Like once I'm always kind, then. Once I'm always happy, then. Many people try to meditate. They try to be always happy. They try to create this constant bliss state where well, I'll be always happy. I'll wake up in the morning, I'll be totally blissed because I'm awake now. It's always blissed. But that's not the way it is. Because it contradicts the way our whole physiology, our mentality is wired. But you can find yourself as something that goes beyond these two things, the body and mind. And with that, beyond condition beyond stuff. You truly find yourself. Where can you find yourself? And again, I'm just going to shortly point to it. 
you can find yourself in the place where you're looking from. If you take that one sentence to heart and you integrate it in your contemplative practices, in your meditation, and you ask yourself, well, where am I looking from? Instead of, ooh, there's a lot of thoughts appearing to me. Ask yourself, who are these thoughts appearing to? Oh, so many emotions. Who is aware of these emotions? Who are these emotions coming for? Who is listening to the voice in your head rather than who talks in your head? Who listens to it? Can't you also listen to it? You can in fact tell your mind right now, go ahead and talk, tell me some stories. You sit down and you wait. And then your mind will start telling you stories. Aren't you listening to them? You the one who is listening, you the one who is seeing, you the one who is knowing experiences as they arise and pass. That is who you are. Or at least you can say, this is at your very center. And that has nothing to do with visualization. It has nothing to do with creating anything. It has nothing to do with birth or death. It has even nothing to do with time at all. Time arises as thoughts. Nothing else. Time is a thought. Outside of thought, no time. You can only experience that if you're getting good in meditation and you access that state. No thought. No time. As soon as you start thinking again, time is born right there again. The more quiet your mind becomes, the less time there is. So that's the experience that you get when you meditate well. You go beyond time. You find yourself there. The Christian word for God or the Hebrew word for God is Yahweh. Yahweh simply means I am. And I am does not point to I will be. It's not. God doesn't say I will be. I am the I will be. Or I am the I was earlier. So I'm that I am. I am that I am. He points in fact to this I am, doesn't he? So what does that feel like? If you direct your attention to that I am, in your own experience, or oh, that's just the feeling of I. Where does that take you? You would have to stop looking for stuff. Because that's where the looking comes from, as I said earlier. So I leave you with just that. You can take that into your meditation, contemplate it, have some fun with it, enjoy it, play. Okay? Nothing serious. It's supposed to make you happy and not more serious <laughs> all right guys is there any questions